All right, hopefully this pops up here soon. Come on. All right, here we go. Okay, so as I said, we we're going to do here, we're going to break this down now into the five principles a little bit more on each one. We're going to cover two today, all right? Popular sovereignty and limited government. So let's take a closer look at these two, which will help you with the assignment that is attached, all right? There we go. Hang on one sec here. Let me hide that. Okay. So popular sovereignty. Uh, we already I gave you the definition, but once again, to reiterate, it is the will of the people, we the people, power to the people. All right. People having the power in government, not government having all the power, but government, OK, operates on the will of the people. The people ultimately have the power. OK, with this principle. Now, why do they think this is necessary? Most of them come from Britain. All right. Where the voice of the people is completely drowned out. All right. It's the kings, the queens, the monarchs of Europe who hold most of the power not the people all right britain was not a democracy at that point in time you're talking about a constitutional monarchy closer to an absolute monarchy their constitution was somewhat ignored all right but but that idea okay is why it's embedded then in our constitution all right want to make sure and this is all in the federalist papers a lot of these are you're going to find these in the federalist anti-federalist papers where you'll find out the fears that they have of what they want to make sure this this constitution will look like look like so it's a lot better than what they were dealing with all right and, and the idea of popular sovereignty and people having the power uh, becomes incredibly important so let's take a look at the history of popular sovereignty a little bit all right um let me see if i can move this all right okay so what does we the in the 18th and 19th century all right um, and you could argue in other elements of the 20th century, too, and maybe even some of the 21st century. All right. But especially early on, what did we the people mean? And let's be honest about this. We the people was it was white males who had like land ownership, had a little bit of money because that's where the power resided. The power resided with them. Why? And what do we say is a great example of popular sovereignty, which is on there, too, like voting. So who actually had the ability to vote? OK. That's what we're looking at. And then who were the ones that were the actual statesmen or the ones that were representing people? All right. They were powerful white males. OK, so how much power was given to? Obviously, we know slaves had no power. All right. Uh, women very limited in the power that they had. All right. Poor white immigrants, very limited. OK, in the power that they had. So some no power, some little power. And then obviously we have a lot of power there. OK, and as time has evolved, each of those groups have somewhat gained more power, some still striving to, to get to the same point of where everyone else is. All right. So important to note, uh, but it is a constitutional principle that we have. Uh, another example of, of the term, because actually popular sovereignty was really coined and termed in the mid 1800s during this time, because it's it's this Kansas, Nebraska Act. And so they're trying to figure out pre-Civil War, they're trying to figure out what do we do to these new territories and states that come into the country? Are they going to be free or slave states? And so they say, well, they, those states should have popular sovereignty. Let them, let the people choose what they want. Let them actually vote on it when they either come in as a state or a territory operating under the United States. And, and this will turn to, if you guys are familiar, if you remember the bleeding Kansas and the conflict that happened out there um, as people were sending people out there to vote. I mean, they were sending people from, from the East Coast to go out there if they wanted them to be either a slave or, or a free state. And so you have all these issues, but that's when popular sovereignty, the term itself would actually really kind of take off. And it would be the Kansas Nebraska Act that played a role, which is going to be on your homework. All right, in today's world, what does popular sovereignty look like? First, you have voting. It's the, it's the easiest, okay, example you can have of popular sovereignty. All right. Where can you wield power in government? The power to vote. All right. And as long as that's not infringed upon or that you and not having that power uh, and using that easiest example, uh, the republic form of government. All right. This is something that's always been around, but it just to explain it to you. I may have brought this up in class, but it's that idea of we elect representatives. OK. To then go represent us. 
all right? So if we elect Marcy Kaptur to serve us, all right, in Washington, D.C., we want us to serve our interests, okay? That's what she does. We don't send how many ever thousand of people are in her district and send them down to, all right, D.C. to vote on everything. She represents us, and so she would go down there and make that vote, all right, since we fall into her district. That's that idea of republic form of government, all right? Um, you're going to see every state has a different amount of representatives that are supposed to represent the people within their district, okay? Um, another one that you can kind of link this to, if you guys are familiar with, so like the post 9-11, obviously we go into conflict. Uh, we're in Iraq. In Iraq, uh, Hussein is overthrown. And we're eventually going to try to hold what they call free elections in um, Iraq. And that was the whole idea. Let the people choose because they didn't they had um, they didn't necessarily have free elections before this. I mean, there was uh, people get, would get their hands cut off, possibly even killed and murdered in election time um, in terms of what was really going on over there during that time. So one of our goals was to oversee and make sure that they were having free elections when electing their who was going to be their leader at that point in time. OK, so let's move on to the next one. Maybe. Come on. OK. All right, sorry for the delay. So let's move me again. Here we go. Limited government. So this is the last one we're going to do today. Shorter video. All right, good for you guys. Uh, limited government, what is it? Government can only exercise those powers delegated to it by the Constitution. So instead of citizens being limited, like most European monarchies, Britain, it was government that was to be limited. All right. Um, and I brought up the Federalist Papers. This was a big thing that they they wrote about and that they talked about. All right. They wanted to make sure that there was this sense of freedom. OK. Um, and, and that government wasn't. Punishing people based off these basic freedoms. So in the best way to think of this is in this next slide, if I get there. Oops. All right. Let's think of the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights. OK, so let's look at the First Amendment right here. You have it in front of you. All right. Right there. Freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. OK. With those, who does that limit? We know there are some limitations in regards to like freedom of speech. It's the old. What do we say? You can't can't yell fire in a theater. Right. That's that's not protected. But for the most part, with speech, religion, press, assembly, OK, who's being limited there? It's government being limited. All right. It's that I can write an article about the president, about representatives. I can write the, anything about government and I can be critical of them. I can put there they're awful. They need to be voted out. They need this. They need that. OK, and I'm not going to be arrested. We say, well, of course, but that's not the case all around the world. All right. Especially a little bit. You go a little bit further back. Where, you know, you write bad things about the government, you possibly, you know, have been in Siberia freezing for a while, never coming back. All right. When you were critical. So these these are things that that became um, incredibly important. All right. You shouldn't have to go to the guillotine because um, you don't practice practice a specific religion that isn't in line with what most people are practicing maybe within the country. That's OK. All right. Um, because government is limited. Same thing. Right. Second Amendment. Maybe I brought this up in your class where we talked about. I have the right to own a pistol. OK. Who's limited in this scenario that they can't take away that right government. Now, can each state have different laws? OK, saying maybe what types of guns. All right. But can they completely take away that right? No. All right. Because they're limited by because of the Second Amendment. But are, th are there going to be tighter restrictions in different states? Yeah. All right. Are there tighter restrictions in California than Ohio in regards to owning guns? Absolutely. OK, but both states, you're still allowed. 
All right, there's just some different types of limitations. And that's where people will say, what is, how far can government go with those limitations? All right, and that's what's up for debate, but government is still limited and completely taken away. Uh, we talk about in today's world, a bill to limit abortions, all right? So let's say a bill, no abortion after 20 weeks. Should they be allowed? Should they be allowed to, where is, where is the line of what government should be limited in doing? It's a good question. All right. Um, modern day, I have on there the bullet point, the modern day conservative or what is Republicans approach to government. Oftentimes their platform will state, you know, that less government is better. All right. Think about which if we go politically, which party more aligns with like being more anti-mask because they think it's a government overreach when they come in and try to mandate anything in regards to mask and how do you enforce it? That's a whole different ballgame. OK, so all, all of those things. But that's the Republican Party more aligns with that being that anti-mask. OK, so understand um, how this works, even in the modern day world, you can think of and that's part of your assignment is there's a lot of stuff. OK, smoking. All right. There used to be, I think this might have been before you guys are born. I'm trying to think when this law came out. I can't think off the top of my head where I'm sure you've been told about. There used to be smoking sections in restaurants, okay, where maybe like a third of the restaurant or where, or in the bar area, depending on where you were at, that was the smoking section. And people could sit there and they could smoke while the other people would be in the non-smoking section. And then they just got rid of that completely, all right? So they said for the general welfare, for health, for those types of things, um, you weren't allowed to smoke. So, and that's still different places you're allowed to, different places that you're not. Um, and that's changed quite a bit in the last 20 years. All right. So that's those two. All right. I think the, the assignment itself, not too difficult. If you have any questions, make sure you get a hold of me. I uh, appreciate it. Get this done by Friday midnight. 